Well, the reason why I think the central banks are losing control is because um, they've really handed over the keys to the kingdom to the traders. And so it's not really the central banks that are making a lot of the choices. The choices that they're making is based upon keeping the traders happy and the markets happy. And what we saw, say, in Australia, uh, where they were attempting yield, and in Japan too. Japan was attempting yield curve control, and Australia was attempting yield curve control. And they make this commitment, look, if you try and push interest rates up, we're just going to buy as many bonds as we need to to keep the interest rates down. But actually, when push came to shove, what actually happened was that the central bank stepped back and said, oh, okay, no, we're not going to do it because it got too expensive. They, they've given the traders all of these really cheap, well, they give them the money basically for free. Right. So they've given them these cheap leverage tools, and then they've given the money to play these markets. So at the end of the day, uh, you know, when I say that I think the central banks are losing control, it's because the traders can overwhelm what central banks are attempting to do with maintaining um, these low interest rates. And we've, and we've been watching that occur. That's why. You know, when things become too expensive, and, you know, and too expensive, I think, is highly dependent on who's leveraged into the market. If it's a too big to fail entity, then it's not too expensive or because we're really talking about, you know, two different things. But if you go back in your mind to that VIX chart, you can see when they hand it over the markets to the traders. It's really obvious. It's like an EKG. So... Um, but now the traders, I mean, you're looking at well over 1.2, 1.3 trillion in the reverse repo market on a daily basis because of all the liquidity that they pumped into the markets. So yes, there are a lot of parts and I haven't said that they've lost complete control. I said that they are losing control, right? And, and really that is because the traders are now experimenting um, more. They're, they're kind of like testing the waters to see how far they can push the central banks before the central bank pushes back. But the other part of that control piece with the central bank is confidence, right? It's the public confidence. And what's also really happening right now is that the inflation is running so hot that the public is noticing Right? They keep it at 2%. They're getting their inflation, but nobody notices, and that's how they've managed to do it. Sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less, depending upon you know what the needs are. But since we are now at the bottom where the currency has virtually no purchasing power left, it only has any because of the confidence. Compared to where it was in, when they first took over, the Federal Reserve first took over. Correct. Yes, Correct. Um, and it's losing value even more rapidly, as we're seeing with this inflation, which they're now barely acknowledging is not, you know, transitory, right? But it's been around since they took over power in 1913. That's definitely not transitory. So it's two pieces that they're really dealing with. One is the higher level where you have Wall Street traders, Right. And that's where we're witnessing the beginning of that, you know, how far can we push the central banks? Central bank says, oh, we're going to maintain those interest rates. Well, no, it became too expensive, and that's why they backed off. And, and we could definitely see that. The other time that it'll become too expensive is, you know, look at what's happening with the public. I, I already set aside a PowerPoint that I started to work on, you know, just before the crash, an updated um, piece on that, because I'm seeing so many signs of it right now that I thought that it was important to do an update on that piece. But part of it, it are all the just naive public getting into these markets hand over fist in 1929 when they pulled the plug, well, they allowed all of this credit in the public uh, or, or gave all this credit to the public. Mm -hmm. And Wall Street was basically out of the markets by 1929. 
So, yeah, certainly it was too expensive to support the public in the markets. So when that piece happens and when the public loses confidence, then they're not, they could... They could print all they want, and it's not going to make any difference at all. And it already makes a whole lot less difference right. than it did, you know, in 2008 when they first started doing it. So there are many layers, but, but that is why. I don't think they are in control of everything. They are in control of their experiments until they don't work, mm -hmm. right? And then they have to figure out how to deal with the unintended consequences of those experiments, but it, whether or not they maintain control is all about confidence. You need to have gold and silver, period, and really in any form. Well, any currency needs not just the trust of the other central banks, but they need the trust of the public. That's actually the most important trust. And if you listen to the central banks talk and you read about this anymore, you're hearing that that's really their biggest concern and their biggest fear. So that's why they would need to back the new SDR, whether it's the ESD, I mean, there's a bunch of SDRs, but they need to put a component of gold in there. I'm not saying that has to be 100%, it's not. But in order to get absolute confidence from the central banks, from the public particularly, not from the central banks as much as it is from the public, that's where that gold component comes in. And hey, could this time be different? <clears throat> of course this time could be different. That's not something I can control. But history shows us 100% of the time that gold as a component comes into the ultimate final currency not all the way along because they're going to just keep doing what they're doing until they burn off all the debt and really transfer all the wealth. But uh, yeah, no, uh, it is not enough for the central banks across the world uh, to trust the IMF. You guys, you need to be prepared. That, that's all I can say. I'm grateful that I am. I'm just going to keep preparing and keep getting everything in place because I'd rather be two weeks, 10 years. I don't care. I would rather be early than one second too late because that's when you lose all of your choices. And you guys all know, a hundred gazillion, bazillion percent, it is time to cover your assets. And we do that with the Wealth Shield, which has 12 components to it, but it's all about having you, giving you the ability or you giving yourself the ability, frankly, to sustain your standard of living, to expand your wealth base so that you can live through this and come out the other side in actually a better condition. And that is, in my opinion, so critically important, not, not for me because, hey, you know, I'm, I'm at the tail end of my life. Don't worry, I'm going to live another 33 years at least. 